and sold into science to help solve swine flu. This is episode 13 of the Tux Radar podcast. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm Mike Saunders. I'm Graham Morrison. And Andrew Gregory couldn't make it today. So we hunted around to try and find someone with as much wit and resolve as Andrew, and we found this squeaky toy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just like the real thing. <laughs> yes. Oh. What's your hot, um, pick of the fortnight, Andrew? Oh, <laughs> Battle of Thorn Waste. <laughs> uh, instead, we have found someone fresh out of school. It's Bob Moss. Say hello, Bob. Hello. Hi, Bob. Nice, Welcome, Bob. Nice and close to the microphone, Bob. Let the world hear your dulcet tones. Hello. And in this podcast, we're talking Google Chrome OS, uh, No Root X, our hot topic, how we all got into the happy world of Linux and our open ballot that isn't quite so open this time. Is Google becoming Microsoft? I am doing the news on this episode, and our first story is a small one that uh, well, barely any of us have talked about. It's the uh. news that uh, a small company called Google is going to release its own operating system called Chrome OS. Go what? Who? Yeah. Uh, sounds like it, ha- it hasn't right. interested me that much, but apparently the whole internet is alive with talk about Chrome OS which is apparently going to be a cut-down Linux-based operating system built primarily to run the Chrome browser, offering a super-fast, super-cool, super-quick, primary-colors way of (laughs) getting your email. It's a a Linux kernel um, with a whole new windowing system and... Which yeah, no on X. Top of it. No X. No X. Oh, so. Which is interesting, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's about time. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, um, as we were talking later about how X is getting better over time, um, but yeah, Google have uh, chucked it away. So interestingly, but, sorry, I've been uh, playing with Moblin two oh, yeah. over the last week, and I can understand why Google has made that decision because X, um, GTK Plus and the whole X server does seem to be a stumbling block to offering a nice integrated seamless desktop environment Mm -hmm. you sometimes can't escape the the crappy little windows that pop up if something goes wrong or the way applications take over the whole window despite all the effort of the moblin project yeah yeah so i can see why they've made this decision but you know this is big news because google has the um facilities to get this stuff in the hands of a lot of people you know, we try to advocate Linux, but it's still it's a name most people haven't heard of. But for for our parents, a lot of people we know, Google is the internet. Yeah, Google is everything. Yeah. If Google says, "Oh, you can," they won't be able to get people to install their own operating systems, but they they can spread the word um, easier. But where does it leave Moblin and uh, Ubuntu Netbook Remix and other Netbook distros? Well, it looks like. It's going to be as close to thin client computing as you can get without it being a thin client. It's it's going to host yeah. the Chrome browser. Well, it's, isn't that Mark Andreessen's quote coming back to life again? How it would reduce Windows to a poorly debug system. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually totally true now. Isn't it? So I mean, there'll still be room, as I see it, for people who want to run standard desktop open source applications. I mean, that's that's where I'd see Moblin fit in. Well, yeah, there have been some supposed leaked screenshots of Chrome OS in action, and people uh, have said you can, um, along with the browser, you can bring up a separate tab to look at stuff uh, files stored locally and run them. So it's it's not just going to be a browser. But that's it. <laughs> and Andrew, what's that, Andrew? <laughs> Andrew, what do, what always chipping sorry, in. I should, sorry, I should be filling in here. What, what do you <laughs> think, Bob? <laughs> I think Google is on a plot to take over the entire world. I don't think they can hear you because you're so far from the microphone. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm new to this whole podcasting thing. Um, but yeah, Google... right, basically, yeah, Google have dominated the web space and slowly they're migrating to the desktop. Will they, is it really taking on Microsoft? You know, I think that's a matter of debate, really, which is raging pretty much everywhere on the net at the moment. But you'd agree they're at least trying to take on Microsoft? They are at least trying, yes. In the same way they're trying to take on Apple with the <laughs> Google phone. Google does these things in a very backhanded kind of way, I think. They, they, they say, look, it's not really anything to compete with Microsoft. It's just, just something that we can run our own little web browser on. You know, it's no threat to anyone. Whereas, in fact, I think they've been probably developing and talking about this for a couple of years, 18 months. And, and this is the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg where things will start to happen. Yeah. I think, I mean, they have said on, it, it was announced on the, um, Google's official blog mm. by their VP of product management. And he said, if application developers are, are interested in writing stuff for the, the Chrome OS, then it's all web-based. 
So, which actually sounds a lot like the iPhone. Uh, well, the iPhone at the start, yeah, when yeah, they said yes, you'd only be able yeah, to write exactly. applications through the net. It sounds yeah. like they want a lot of... I mean, it's going to be open source, but mm. they're going to want to control the interface. But it, it's a good thing to tackle at the start, isn't it? Google, with Chrome, the browser, knows how to make a good browser. They know how to make good web apps. So, yeah, if they, if they start off there, then... But isn't, that, isn't that their native client project, which is designed to run actual native code through web apps? Right, for things where they want high speed acceleration, basically, so you can write your scientific apps using native client. Whether or not that's part of the larger right. Chrome OS plan or not, we don't know. But they have, as you say, a lot of disparate plans whizzing around, and well, occasionally they kind of collide like planets of space. And then, uh, yeah, like, oh, well, this might work. There is a secret recipe somewhere. Yeah, they all align. Sun power. <laughs> 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 we can go that way. That seems to work. But how does it fit into Android? That's what I don't get. What's the plan for Android? Well, they, they've they've said that. Uh, well, Steve Ballmer's already made a remark about this, saying something along the lines of, "I, I don't understand what Google's doing here with two client operating systems," <laughs> which is a bit funny coming from Microsoft. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't. It's it's all really fresh and new. And we don't really know. But but Android is seems to be targeting the really small end devices, and Google Chrome will be. Uh, it's hard to say a general purpose desktop operating system, but. I think this is interesting leading on to our open ballot later, but mm. I think I think it's the first sign that Google is so big that sometimes the left hand isn't going to always know what the right hand is doing. And Android and Chrome OS are possibly two completely independent projects that just happen to overlap in the middle. They're both areas that Google wants to move into, but they don't really understand how they're true, going to do it. It's just terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a big company now. I mean, I know I, there's twenty thousand employees at Google. Now. I don't see yeah. why. You know the two are so closely related. I don't. There's got to be some kind of um, point where Android and Chrome OS meets. And so far, early days, very little information, but there's no proof of it. Bob, do you think this is going to be a good thing for Linux or a bad thing for Linux? Well, ultimately, it's going to be a good thing if we're if the goal is for manifestation and where we want more people to be using Linux. Manifestation, yes, wow. manifestation indeed. Um, Even but- though they won't know they're using Linux. Yeah, that is, that is the thing which I was about to come on to, which is, will they know that they're free? That, that is the big question. <laughs> and how free will they be? And how free will they be that all their applications are running closed on Google servers? Exactly. <laughs> Should they care that it's free? <laughs> Should they care yeah. that it's free? Yeah. Information wants to be free. No, information wants to be useful. Oh, right. Says Larry Wall. Ah, hmm. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll get on to more of that later on. Well, what, what's, what's the business model? Just quickly, how do they make money? Are there, are there like, adverts? Is it is it like a tying in of uh, Clippy? Like it looks like you want to do this. Why not do click this link and do that? Yeah, it's context sensitive advertising, isn't it? Based on the actual information that they've been collecting. And you know. yeah, but to, I mean, they do they do have the principle of giving everything away for free, getting people hooked, and then monetizing it later, don't they? And mm. and perhaps I don't know how much time they spend thinking about. Well, they'd say monetizing you, it you, if you control the platform from the ground up. You can stop certain other things happening. You know, it's it's amazing how successful Google has been in a Microsoft-dominated computing world. But they know that. But to be fair, MS were completely conf- confused about the internet at the beginning, weren't they? They they were like, oh, it's not important. Oh yeah, it's a fad. It'll if, go away. If they'd had a proper strategy, they, oh, yeah. they they could have done a lot more, and people would be using well, not Bing now because Bing was born out of a reaction. <laughs> all their other <laughs> failed web service or services. Yeah. Certainly, Google, if they aren't in it to make money, there is the other quite scary prospect that they're in it just to annoy Microsoft. <laughs> or, or they're in it to be taken up by a government. They'll be in it to make money, but I, I get the feeling that they, they go a lot on in gut instinct, and the fa- fact is we have to compete with Microsoft. There's this great big white elephant sitting over there on the horizon. It yeah. hasn't budged for 15 years. You know, <laughs> Let's run up to it and go, boo! <laughs> <laughs> or you see that Office 2010 for Microsoft will have a, we- a web component to yeah, yeah, try and compete yeah, with Google yeah. Docs. Cut down as yeah, well, I like yeah. that. Yeah, that's not going to do much for them. I think, <laughs> I think Google's got a chance of winning that fight. That's it. And another bit of related news and connected to what we were talking about earlier on, on the X server front, Moblin is going to run the X server with user privileges um, and not root administrator privileges, as has always been the case up until this point. They actually claim it's going to be the first version of Linux running with user privileges. Um, they think this is a great step forward for computer kind. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm, I haven't really had that many exploits on my X server. No, well, well, 
it's it's a good step forward in the modernization of X, isn't it? To have yeah, these yeah. bits still running in kernel space is um, has been tricky. And it's been yeah, it hasn't caused any problems. No, yeah, you know, I, I just don't get X server crashes anyway. Is it now. down to exploits or down to occasionally it's potentially possible that X may lock up your machine beyond SSH and fix it? Yeah, it's just nuked your machine. Thanks, X. And that's true. And I think more importantly, behind the scenes, it means that now things and the like kernel the, can nuke your machine. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, things things like the X server can access your graphics hardware at a at a low level without requiring system administrator privileges. Um, so that that's got to be a good thing. Whether it will make any difference to the end user experience, I seriously doubt. Didn't you talk to? We both did talk to Keith Packard a while back, mm. and it yes, yeah. February last year or something. And he was working on this, wasn't he? Kernel mode setting being the first move towards... The, yes, there was something bulletproof X they yeah, were talking yeah, about. Yeah, the, again, or, more bulletproof X. Yes, yeah. It seems um, to be... It's not very fast moving forward, but at least it is trundling forward. Yeah, I think X is one of those things that... You get a lot of people attacking it and saying, oh, it's so old that, you know, we should just throw it away. But I think it's just... It's, it's like a big ship. You've got to steer it in the right direction. It's not something you can just fiddle around with and... Change. I think I think uh, Larry and Sergey disagree. <laughs> well, well, yes, uh, we'll see how it goes. But for for the you know desktop computing Linux purposes that that um, we're involved with, yeah, it it seems harder to take it X in radical new directions. I mean that may be born out of the fact that it spent a lot of time as X three eight six, which was notorious for you know getting very little done. So. X.org has certainly introduced more innovations than that old you know, steering committee and group and bureaucracy. I think, actually, after you saying all that, I'm with Google on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's so complicated. You know, user-level mode, kernel-level kernel mode, user privileges, system administration privileges, running things through the hardware. What the hell is the X yeah, server yeah, still doing, you, knocking you, around? You get um, good remote um, application. Well, also, and we all use also, the X server well, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, if, if we didn't have to explain to people that actually the X server is the client and the client is the server, yeah. oh, we wouldn't sell magazines anymore, would we? <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> Trying to make some money true. from tutorials, you know? Didn't Google also announce that it was using... It did, Developed its own NX server they using did. open source. I know. Source. It was just suspiciously same time as yes. Google, Google <laughs> yeah. OS, didn't they? Yeah, it did. And that might be interesting talking about remote desktops and Google owning the desktop, you know. Yeah. Let's pretend this is your computer. No, no, it's not. Uh-huh. Well, I think one thing we've seen with um, uh, XGL, remember XGL? Yeah, yeah. It became mm. AIGLX, but it was, it was still standardized. Now we have a desktop that's standardized with this great functionality. Some guy made an awesome hack. Uh, it got forked and reforked and fiddled around with, but eventually it became the standard. I think it's very possible that if Google does the X system better, if they implement the X library calls to do make GTK work or whatever, without the actual X server side behind it, that'd be awesome because then the X guys can go, hey, we can take this bit, take this bit, take this bit, and everyone, yeah, everyone benefits. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's great to see X moving forward. Such a real fundamental part of Linux, just moving forward still. So. Yeah, it's fundamental. I agree. <laughs> And now it's time for your favourite section and mine, Hot Topic. Hot Topic. This time we're focusing on Linux history. We posted a good story on Tux Radar previously asking folks when, how, what made you get started with Linux in the first place. Was there a real big turning point for you? Were there real highlights? Uh, guys, let's start with you guys. What, where did you start with Linux? What really made you think this is it? Well, um, for me, um, I know that um, Mike and I actually share a very similar story despite the fact that it's completely unrelated but uh my initial attempt to getting linux running was on an amiga and it was a red hat 5.1 which i think is the same that, as that you. was the first distro that i used yeah but i didn't have it, it wasn't usable i couldn't get x running and couldn't do all that much with it so it's do you mean you couldn't do much with it the command line you had emacs it ter- terrified me <laughs> slr it does terrify me actually. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of sat like that for uh a couple of years, and uh, mm-hmm. I happened to be living in France and uh, read about this thing called Mandrake Linux, which uh, used to be on the cover of a magazine called Planet Linux. Planet, there was a wow, yeah, was, it was great. Planet it was, it was. I don't know if it's still going, um, but anyway, they used to put Mandrake on whenever it was released, and Mandrake Seven, um, which I, I wrote down, it's called it was Helios. The Helios was released. Ah, it was yeah, the, the first code, no. one I got running on my. Uh, my PC, and it was fantastic right from that moment. I, I understood it, it all clicked. Things like package management and system administration became clear, and I was hooked. Yeah, and I, I got a, I was like, yeah, I got Red Hat 5.1 off a magazine called PC Direct, which died years ago, um, and then got Red Hat 5.2 off 
Linux this, this system is standard PC, x86 x86 right? yeah and then got 5.2 off our system mag PC plus and um, but I, w- I was only really playing around at the time I had to like recompile my kernel to get sound working and stuff it's when I bought a massive SUSE box set um, from the Linux Emporium they were thing. great work yeah, how it's much was that proper then? box set I, I think it was, it was you know 40 quid or something with the books with, with the big yeah. thick the two, box yeah, two books, I think, yeah. yeah I, I had no internet can access, internet access up north and, <laughs> <laughs> so, up north up north so um, yeah so receiving six CDs and you know full of software I just spent months exploring it and you know gigantic books yeah, was, yeah. was brilliant but I, I think it was about Mandri the 7 for me where um, SUSE was good but it was very complicated and very deep and involving, whereas Mandriva were really striving with the graphical installer. That's when I thought, this this Linux thing can be big. So you were a KDE mm. user back then, then? I really liked uh, KDE 1, yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> I uh, went on to uh, Window Maker, so... <laughs> yeah. Never looked back. Never looked back. <laughs> yeah, well, there are a number of great comments in our uh, Tux Radar. It was surprising how many folks had, st- had started with Slackware, and uh, are still using Slackware. <laughs> 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 That's great, because for the first, you know... Until I, you know, it sounds sad, until I settled on Ubuntu, I was, you know, jumping around distros every, every six months. Not so every, every four months. I'm <laughs> just changing distros randomly, getting later stuff, more stuff, more stuff. And it's really cool to see people who have stuck with, I mean, like, you know, as Simon said, he's, he got Slackware from floppies in 95. It's, Respect. It's still his favorite distro. That's just great. Is it, he incarcerated or is there <laughs> <laughs> He's still got his floppies from 95. <laughs> Maybe he's connecting to the net via that distro. Yeah. With Telnet. What about you, Bob? What's your experience? Well, as the new kid on the block, I might sound a little inadequate on this one, but um, Mandriva 2005 was my first distro which I used, and it's mostly mm. personal computer world, cover disk. Um, PC, don't Yeah, exactly. <laughs> J- died last month. Oh, right, I'm, I'm genuinely gutted. Um, but anyway, I was using that mostly on my parents' computer to see what it would do, and completely annoyed them. My first distro, though, which I actually committed to hard disk, was Ubuntu Feisty, because it just made sense. It just worked out of the box, which... But yeah. was there a particular highlight of any, any of these Linuxes? You thought that this was a particularly great Linux for its time. Well, it it just seemed to do things better than Windows XP did. I mean, feisty. Well, feisty generally. Um, but I mean, you could just go sudo app get install, and all of a sudden this that piece didn't of scare, that didn't scale. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely so enough, coming from Windows XP, you had to open up uh, a shell, type. had to remove. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, it just downloaded and installed. Whereas with XP, you had to go out, buy a software package, bring it home install it manually. Whereas you could just type in a line on the terminal or go into the add and remove and it would just install for you. Yeah. Well, Bill Davidson, um, he had the MCC <laughs> oh. on, his, on his 386 16 megahertz machine with 8 megs of RAM. And I think he's saying here, it has a tell, he was still running 1.2.13 until the year 2000. Is that going to be kernel 1.2, presumably? Um, kernel 1.2? Yeah, well, it must have obviously not been Y2K compliant, and that's why you stopped. <laughs> <laughs> until why that yeah. message was sent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> December the 31st, 1999. There does seem to be a lot of, of Mandrake love out there, and I remember using 8.2 myself and thinking this was, this was uh, pretty good. Um, at the time, though, the, the machine I was using had very, very bad RAM. So I, I was convinced that it was really Fliggy OS. <laughs> it kept bailing out. I was like, what's going on with this terror? Um, there, yeah, it's amazing how many people have been sticking with distros a very, very long time. Red Hat particularly, uh, from the late 90s, seems very, very popular across the world. But yeah, Slackware. I think it was Slackware obviously has changed in many respects, but it's, it's kept a lot of its um, philosophy and approach the same over the years. You know, the simplicity and not big, complicated package databases and the like. So I can see why some people think, I know Slackware, I'm just going to keep using it. It's not going to, you know, change underneath my feet too much. There's not much of any surprises, I guess, there is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So was there a particular distro for you, Graham, that had, for its time, killer features, was way ahead of the rest? What other, well, it was, it was Mandrake 7 that was the turning point. And what was the big feature there, do you think? Um, what really changed? Well, as, as I've mentioned, it was package management and, uh, and the configuration tools. Yeah, but, um, that's, that's probably true. For me, though, it's, I think I said SUSE 9.3. I believe that. I don't use SUSE anymore. I used it for that version basically for six months or so. And uh, suddenly in that one version, they just jumped ahead a long way. 
it was the first ones to really include a working B out of the box, working Zen <laughs> stuff out of the box, working F spot out of the box, you know. Yeah, I, things yeah. we accept, for, you know, it's pretty, very standard today, you know, wow, it has Zen working, well, it's amazing, everyone's got Zen working nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Back then, it was ahead of the pack. I think I remember we all switched to Sousa yeah, at that all, point. We all, we all got very excited about it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we all switched off Sousa <laughs> since then. <laughs> it switched lasted off about Sousa. six months, I think. A lot of Sousa love for a Until while. Until the next show came out. Sousa yeah. honeymoon period. Yeah, well, exactly. That's, that's the nature of uh, free software, isn't it? When someone innovates, everyone else copies yeah. and re-innovates and re-innovates. And, and that's the way it works. And it's great. That's why, why things move on so fast. But that really stands out for me in my history, that it was the first one to actually make a proper leap forward. And we get a lot of press releases through from Fedora team, and it's great to read them. I'm very glad to read them. But they often say how Fedora is the future of Linux, or it's the next generation of Linux, and the, the new features are pretty slim on the ground sometimes. Not always, sometimes they're very slim on the ground. Whereas that one, Susan release really stands out as being, wow, these guys have really pulled out all the stops to make this one really work. Yeah, yeah. And there are a few people put, rooting for uh, smaller ones. There was a Turbo Linux, an Igdras, I- Igdras- Igdrasil? Good grief, Igdrasil from 94 <laughs> <laughs> on his Pentium 90. I think it's great. There's, you know, there's, people have maintained a passion for that long. They're still, you know, is that distro still going? Mm, Oliver no. Berry says he used SLS. That's really impressive. Four floppies downloaded over FidoNet. Four floppies? It's bloatware. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think in this particular example, uh, Slackware wins. Well, that, it, if you go Slackware if you're in it for the long run. Yeah. We, we put up your, your Slackware feature, didn't we, on Tux Radar? Mm-hmm. It's on the front page still. So if you listen to this and you haven't seen Mike's Slackware feature, check it out it's on the front page of Tux Radar right now. Now that's making amends for the uh, distro roundup I wrote in 2000, which didn't include Slackware. <laughs> Sorry, Slackware fans. It's also on the website, and the, look, from the archives. <laughs> from best, the archives, yeah. Distros, best distros. From the very first issue of the Linux format, I think. It was indeed, yeah. And you completely issue one. ignored Slackware. I did, and uh, you know, I'm still getting the letter bombs today. <laughs> <laughs> By post. But, yeah. <laughs> And with that explosive debate, we come to the halfway of our podcast still to come, the discovery of the week, fortnight, month, and of course, our open ballot. Is Google becoming Microsoft? Okay, and now we're on to discovery of the week, fortnight, month, as Paul Hudson put it. Okay, and who'd like to start first, Mike? Well, why not? (laughs) (laughs) Who would like to start first, Mike? (laughs) Thanks, Bob. Um, My discovery of the week is not a game, um, (laughs) and it's called Twindy, and this is a window manager that has been inspired by an audio... (laughs) Excellence. It's inspired by an audio sequencer called Traction. Have you ever heard of that, Graham? Yes, I have. Right. Well, you you might understand what I'm talking about here. This gives you... This um, sets up a series of tabs along the top of the screen, which act um, as workspace switches, and then tabs down the left for running programs, and then a a separate bar, um, a kind of rectangle along the bottom where you can include a secondary program. So you've got your full main program, like your Firefox window, and then a small box underneath with like an Xterm or a text editor in and then a kind of keypad panel on the left for window operations i'm not sure how useful it is but it looks really really funky and it um, sounds like mission command for uh, the apollo land it, yes it looks like some sort of star trek-esque control panel um i think if, if you run in a couple of apps like a lot of us do a lot of the time you know you've got firefox open and a text editor open then it works really well um do but, you know do you know why it's good i don't know traction that well do you know why it would be good for traction uh, I don't know. No, because I, I, no. I don't know anything. I did, I did see it running. It does look really nice. Mm. The guy's done a great job. It looks really integrated. Yeah, and you, you can go and um, play around with the settings and colours very easily. So, I, I, you know, it's always worth trying out new window managers when they're free because you might find something that, you know, hits you and says, yeah, that's that's the way I, I want to work. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's designed for a, a musical application because you know what you need and you need to have the same things in the same place every time. Yeah, like a kind of kiosk yeah, setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's my discovery of the week. Okay, so on to you, Graham. <laughs> Mine is a game. You... <laughs> Mine is a game. It's a zero sum game, isn't it? Really? <laughs> Mine is a game that you play online. It's called uh, the Wikipedia game. It's the third hit if you Google for it because the first hit is game on Wikipedia. The game. <laughs> now, now I've just lost the game. What it is is basically you have um, it generates uh, presumably randomly a, a source article and a destination article Mm -hmm. and you have to get from the source article to the destination article in as few links as possible 
And you do this while you're playing online with other people who are also doing exactly the same thing with the same source and destination articles. So there's like a sort of server that's watching you. Yes, and yeah, and, and you can create an account if you want to have your stats tallied and uh, you want to have your name flash up when you win. So it's like it's like a massive international version of the Kevin Bacon Yeah, game. it is. It's exactly that. And it's I find it, it genuinely addictive because... You have to think quickly, but at the same time, you have to use a certain amount of logic. Of course, there are, there are ones where you quickly get to countries and try Con- and... Countries yeah, well, but, lot, but yeah. some of them aren't like that. Some of them involve actually having to read the article and, and using a little bit of your own knowledge to try and guess where, where the path is most likely to be fruitful. Right, yeah. Um, and and, and you, it's very... When you do that, it feels great when you actually manage to decode it. Have you ever been to Wikipedia and seen those big donation bars at the top? Where <laughs> they try and get money to pay for all the bandwidth they're using. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This game must do you know be why they have this that? Game must be People cut. like you is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> if Wikipedia's modus operandi is to spread learning, you learn a great deal skipping through articles. Is that modus operandi? <laughs> See, I, this is quite referential, I think. I always thought Wikipedia was itself a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. <laughs> where everyone, everyone pretends to be an expert and role-plays it for a while. Oh, yeah, I, I thought the goal was to edit the uh, Super Noodles page and add flavours without anybody noticing. <laughs> <laughs> or to create spurious microOS pages. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's a lot of fun and you can try it. It's easy. Okay, so moving on to Paul. I'm feeling talkative at the moment. I found some cave mapping software. (laughs) (laughs) It's got a good GUI with it. Stereon 2. No, I found some... It's just a a very interesting article someone wrote uh, called Dustin Curtis is the name. And it's very well worth reading. Uh, The article's called You Should Follow Me on Twitter. And all he did was... He publishes articles on his website naturally and all he did was at the end of it say... He used to say, I'm on Twitter, with a link through to his Twitter account, and people would click that and uh, and follow him. And he said, in the beginning, they had a 4.7% click-through, just saying, I'm on Twitter. What he, what he did was, he wrote a little script to say, okay, give people 5,000 people this message, 5,000 this message, 5,000 this message, and he monitored the click-through. And he found that, say, I'm on Twitter, gets 4.7% click-through. If you say, follow me on Twitter, you get 7.31% click-through. <laughs> If you say, more personal, you should follow me on Twitter, because it was 10.09%, if you add a sort of imperative location here, you should follow me on Twitter here, it goes up to 12.81%. So it's actually 173% higher click-throughs by the end, just by just by modifying a couple of words at the very end. That's People, amazing. It makes it all click through more by being more personal. You should follow me on Twitter here. It's amazing the difference it takes. And, and you know, we're on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and you should follow us on Twitter. <laughs> at, here. Uh, <laughs> yes, here. At uh, Tux Radar, of course. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's great to get people connected and stuff. Um, but it's very strange how... Uh, a few little wording changes can make such a big difference to people. Yeah, now, now that you're on Twitter, Graham, is this the uh, is this what you're going to adopt? I'm, I'm this not strategy? on Twitter. I'm I thought con- you were. I'm a to- consumer of Twitter. <laughs> you're consumer, right. But you're still I, on Twitter, think, aren't you? I am. Yeah, yeah, I what's am. Your, but I, I'm account? not telling you what uh, what I'm having for breakfast. What's, what, what's your account name? <laughs> My account name is Degville. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be adding that then. Yeah, we're all yeah. going to oh, follow you, you now. Follow oh, Greg. Greg. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do at, at Degville. What are you having for breakfast, Graham? <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's it's a fascinating way of uh, digesting nugget-sized pieces of information. I am I am slightly hooked. So uh, thanks for that, Paul. Mm. What you explained actually sounds to me like your cover strategy every month for sticking things on the cover of Linux Format magazine. Really? We've got yeah. a strategy? <laughs> <laughs> Read this here now. Read by this magazine here. Yeah, please! <laughs> we'll be out in the streets otherwise. <laughs> Okay, so on to the final discovery of the week, which would be my one. Really? Um, yeah, we've got Flyback, which is, basi- which is basically the Linux equivalent of Apple's Time Machine. I mean, we reviewed a product recently about, um, well, called Back in Time. Mm. And this is the product, which if essentially it's based on. And it runs silently in the background using CronTab. And basically it only runs when your device is actually plugged in, as per CronTab. And the only time you really need the interface, which is in Python, so it will run pretty much on any distro, is... Um, when you're rescheduling, or if you want to restore. So it's a flyback. Isn't that the name of some sort of motor or something? <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought it was a hairstyle to start with, actually. <laughs> well, isn't, isn't Cron rubbish? Isn't, isn't Anacron where it's at nowadays? Well, cause well, it, oh, it, oh, it wasn't plugged in, we won't run that back up then. <laughs> uh, that might be what back in time uses, actually. Also, wouldn't you rather have it something... I'm just 
thinking out loud here in a way. Wouldn't you rather have it, oh, the file's changed, let's sync the file? As opposed to, well, let's do it every hour. Well, yeah, or... it, do, it does occasionally use... I think it uses our sync, but I will have to double-check my facts on that one. <laughs> double-check your facts? We don't do that around here. You must be new here. <laughs> <laughs> we just carry on as if nothing's happened. Oh, right, okay. like Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken feed. So normally here we'd have the open ballot section, but a few listeners um, seem to have been a bit peeved about our choices of open ballot. So this is not an open ballot, this is us debating something. Yes. If you've got an idea for a good open ballot question, then please, by all means, post it on the site in the comments. Um, So for this Uber discussion, we're going to say... Is Google becoming Microsoft? And that's a big, broad question, but it's what a lot of people are asking now that Google Chrome OS yeah, is coming out. Yeah. I, th- I think the answer is yes. Really? I think it's really? inevitable. I think any company that grows to a certain size, gets such a market dominance, inevitably becomes Microsoft. That's like establishing some sort of law there, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think, to say, I think that might well be, yeah. What, what about if the... Under- Modified Godwin's law. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, what about if the, the underlying culture is different? You know, the, what- Well, I think the culture today is different, you know, um, and I've got a lot of respect for Google, but in 15, 20 years' time, however long Microsoft's been going, when all the original people have left, Google's sitting on this stack of incredible data, mm. um, different executives sitting on the board thinking, what can we do with this data? I know, we'll sell it to the Gestapo. (laughs) (laughs) You've got a positive view of the future then. Yeah, yeah. So Godwin's Law. But I mean, you are drawing a lot of parallels because when Microsoft was the new kid on the block, IBM was this big... Yeah, that's That's a good good point, yeah. yeah. And now Google's come along with this big new king of... You know, kid on the block with Microsoft, this big scary thing. Well, that, that's a good point because you know we we all like to support the underdog in many cases, but Google is not a tiny <laughs> little company that we're all saying, you know, oh, go on, you can do it. It's it's huge. Well, what sparked this debate, I think, was um, Anil Dash's essay on uh, Google and Microsoft. And one parallel he pointed out is that you know you might think Microsoft is so huge compared to Google, and it is right now big. But when Windows ninety five came out, they only had about seventeen thousand employees. So Google's already passed the Windows 95 point of Microsoft size. Yeah, yeah. They're getting quite large. Yes, and, and for so many people, Google is the internet. I know that is the case for my parents now. They, they, Google is a launching point for everything that they do on the internet. I don't yeah, think they yeah. see it as a search engine. Or If they're listening to this, I'm really sorry. But, um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, it, and, and that's how a lot of people are going to perceive it. Yeah. Google is the start page of the internet. I don't know where the end page is, but... Well, yeah, and I, that's where the little bosses, isn't it? That'd be great. Yeah, the final boss of the internet. <laughs> and it's it's not really a criticism. I think it's inevitable. I don't know how you can steer a ship that size and, and not, you know, eventually have to give in to the financial pressures of that a company like that. You know, sooner or later, it's going to lose its momentum and its brilliant, innovative ideas, and at that point, it's going to become Microsoft. If <laughs> if, if you feel that, then what? What could they do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you say that about Microsoft? <laughs> no, and get away with it. <laughs> um, yeah. What can we or they or anybody, the industry, the internet do then to prevent this from happening, if anything? Yeah. Let, well, let's hope the answer isn't switch to Yahoo. <laughs> yeah, switch to Bing. Well, it's a good question. And, you know, the fact that so much of what Google has done is open source, I mean, all credit to them, mm. um, is is going to give us a lot more control over their innovation and the technologies. That well, you say that, but this is one of Anil's points. He made he made so many awesome points. We'll put the link in this into the podcast notes because you really should read this essay. Uh, he said, today, protestations of, but it's open source, are being used to paper over real concerns about data ownership. And the truth is that open code doesn't necessarily imply that average users are in control. Which is true. Which is absolutely true. Yes. yes. And the code technically remains on their servers. There's no obligation under the GNU GPL v2 that they actually have to redistribute it. Correct. Yes, yes, this is this is true. I mean, I, I think we like their products. I like their products. I really like Google Mail. Um, I've, you know, I haven't had a reason yet where I've, I've used one of their products and thought this is really bad or this offends me or this gets in my way. So, you but know, also there isn't an alternative, is there? Really? I mean, Yahoo Mail. I haven't tried it in years, though. It might be really mail. good now. Yahoo Mail and Hotmail used to be awful, but... Have you used Google Voice Search, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> On the iPhone, We yeah. tried, just out of interest, we tried searching for um, Linux format, on the Google iPhone voice search thing to see what it said. It didn't recognize Linux, so we tried Linux format, 
and it matched Linux against lion eggs. Which is something we search for all the time. Lion eggs. Lion eggs. Lion eggs. Lion eggs. <laughs> Lions don't lay eggs, but obviously that's more important than Linux, or Linux for that yeah. matter. They just didn't get it. So obviously they don't, they don't succeed in every space, do they? No, but, uh, you know, so you just don't use that, that program. But I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt while they're making good stuff and not getting in my face. But I think that also raises an interesting point, that it, it seems to be now at a stage where Google is... Um, giving its own products, such as Android, preferential treatment, even in the face of, say, say the iPhone, for example, which has got such a, a massive installed user base compared mm. to Android. Google is preferring Android over the iPhone in the face of more people using the iPhone. Well, they've got, some, applications. Yeah, they've got some interesting situations there. Eric Schmidt sits on Apple's board, and of apparently course, yeah, he yeah. doesn't attend meetings when they're about the iPhone because it would you but, know, there'd be uh, too much crossover. But had, if Google wasn't involved with Android, then... Mm. I'm sure it would be far more um, active on the iPhone. Well, apparently there are 40 times more iPhones out there than there are uh, G1s and G2s. It's a huge difference, but you're right. It is very strange when they choose to develop for Android specifically. And that's an MS tactic, isn't it? It is, yeah, it is, of course. A lot of people in. I mean, one of the things Anil said is that, you know, it used to be very common that MS would say, oh, yeah, you can, you can get your media to your Xbox, but only if you're using Windows Media Player. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. you know, little t- tactics like that that tie you in across the board, and it's just not very pleasant. But one of the awesome things is, on, on Twitter, uh, Matt Cutts, who's the head of web spam at Google, said, all Googlers should read Anil's piece and try to agree with it as much as possible, not find points to disagree on. Really? He that's said he that? Said. He said, yeah, he said, he said, go and read it. And that's the difference, I think. They, they, they'll they read it and they'll recognise, wait a minute, this is wrong. <laughs> we are starting to lose our way a little bit, and I think they may try and correct it. So that, that's a sign of openness within the company. Yeah. People can speak out against, against or, or, or voice concerns about... Yeah, he even said uh, to um, um, Danny Sullivan, O'Sullivan, uh, the uh, search engine watch guy mm-hmm. saying you know it reminds me of your old piece of reasons why i hate google you should do that again by the way <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because they, they want to know what people don't like and if if realistically one of the things they don't like is increasing the culture i think they're willing to change that still yes yeah if, if they've still got this culture where people can spend half an hour a week on their own product and projects then and and this ability to speak out and, and bounce it, ideas around a week, isn't it? is it a full day a week oh yeah, right 20 percent time Right, it could be, yeah. I, I, Unless it works two and a half hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, do you, uh, you you use Google Mail? I know that for sure. So. Yeah. Well, I'm an obsessive user of it, actually, and I actually use Google Docs in order to sync my documents everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm, sli- I'm slightly concerned because, obviously, I'm leaving Google in control of my data. I mean, what happens if Google goes bust or, say, a government comes in and says, I want that data? I mean, the what, chi- what data is it that you're storing on your Google account? <laughs> <laughs> it's highly confidential. <laughs> highly confidential stuff, yeah. Shopping lists and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, for instance, the Chinese government um, on, asked Google to filter out results on its search engine on the google.cn site. So, I mean, what's to stop another government, say, going to Google and saying, can you please filter out X, Y and Z results? This is the risk, isn't it? I mean... You know, some people would argue we should all be using as many different services as possible, spread the load over the internet and spread the... Um, you, we get in perhaps more towards a single point of failure. Yeah. Um, if Google... I think governments are too inept, actually, to do much with data, as history's proven, proven. But if the, co- if, the co- if the corporate culture of Google changes, if, if there's a massive, like, boardroom coup and they Which, suddenly decide to monetize the hell out of everything, yeah. and that's what you fear, I, Graham. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I do think it will happen, yeah, sooner or later. It's just... Well... It's, I know, but don't you think, I certainly feel I'm irrationally attached to my email. Yeah, if I lost yeah. all my email tomorrow, I'd probably care about the last ten or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's happened before in the past where I've lost all my email. It's been terrible for that morning. Yeah, yeah. I know. I've got over <laughs> it. The whole morning, I'm like, oh, no, no email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things you don't care about until it's gone. You know, I've got old mailboxes from, like, 99 and stuff. Yeah, and I think yeah. I'd feel really well, I, upset I if I lost all my old ma- mailboxes to my Google mail account. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> Be terrible. So you've got this big complicated kind of web of former accounts yeah, yeah. And piping in. I think one of the most awesome points that Anil made, and this is just incredible, is that ultimately once a tech company becomes dominant in its space, it's susceptible to a kind of reverse Hanlon's razor. Anything caused by stupidity or carelessness will instead be attributed to malice. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's, yeah. that is so true. Anything they do. Remember, was it was a few months ago, there was a Google problem. They were reporting every site as being dodgy for about an hour and a half. Yes, yeah. It was, it was, was on fun. BBC News. <laughs> I can't use Google, says the world. And then yeah. the world goes crazy. I can't use the internet. Yeah, I know, says yeah. Says Mike's mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's it's big problems, and it was just a small thing, root error or something like that. You know, it's, it's small fry stuff, but people start wondering, oh no, what what if Google goes down? What if a government's taking over Google? Or who knows what? Space uh, aliens space tapping aliens, into yeah. Google. Maybe it's being operated by space aliens. Let's get yeah. my tinfoil hat on here. So, uh, yes or no, guys? And uh, I don't I believe. Yes or no, Mike. Sorry. Yes or no. <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> No, no, Boris, they're not. Boris, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Is Google Chicken becoming beans. Microsoft? Yeah. <laughs> no, not yet. No. <laughs> One word, no. That's a yes from me, Paul. Bob? I'm kind of sat on the fence. You I can't mean... sit on the fence. <laughs> yes or no or yo. Yes, or no. yes, if they forget their original goals and imperatives, I That's think. The... Are you going to be a politician when you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> when that you the... grow up? <laughs> How patronising are you? <laughs> I'm 18, I'm an adult. The question isn't about Google. <laughs> it's a bigger question. Well, I, think, I, I think no. I think they're going to see this essay and change their ways. Didn't they offer you a job once? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. If they did, I wouldn't be here now. <laughs> oh, wait, bugger, our policy list is this. <laughs> I, I actually went to um, one of the Q, um, KD developers' conferences. We went to the Google HQ in Dublin. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was rather sinister. What they did is they planted Google employees amongst the delegates. You couldn't actually, you didn't know they were Google employees. And they'd start talking to you about what you think of Google, how do you feel about the place, do you think it's a nice place to work, before then admitting that they worked for Google and they were looking for people to work with them. Ah, oh, it's a bit like those uh, secret shoppers. Yeah, doing yeah, tests exactly. And, and it really gave me the creeps. At least they're trying to care, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's a good way to do market research because if somebody comes along and says, tells you right from the start, you might, you know, you want to be polite and not. Want to also, well, I, think, I think it's pretty cool that you can't tell the difference between a Google employee and everyone else. They didn't all have cheese on yeah, their exactly. forehead. They don't, they don't wear posh shirts well, or anything. Maybe I'm too cynical, but I, I think, you too cynical. Yeah. <laughs> but I felt, you know, K developers, they they want to employ some of them. What's the best way of getting to them? We'll, we'll pretend to be like them and then, you know, pull off our mask at like the not, end of Scooby Doo. Are they? They're not pretending, are they? They could have worn a badge and said, I'm a Google employee. <laughs> this is what it's, I've got to admit, it's a bit strange. We look around and you start realising how many people are employed by Google. That was one, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, I think Robert loves Google. Um, you know, um, there's so many of them nowadays. Uh, when I, you know, when you use Vim, you think, oh, Vim's very nice, isn't it? Well, you know, Bram's Bram, actually employed Bram by Google. Bram Moulinar. Yeah, yeah, he's employed by Google. There must be a lot of uh, Vim users inside the company. Yeah, but, you know, uh, Guido Van Rossum. Yeah. There are, there are many, many, many. And often, very often, the ones that aren't employed by Google are employed by Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> and not Microsoft. No, yeah. not Microsoft. Yeah. Not Microsoft. And with that terribly unsubtle way to get hired by Google, we come to the end of our podcast. Yeah, good one, Paul. Yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, we know, we know it's not going to happen. You, you can finish it off later. I want to finish it off with one more thing. Oh, go on. A bit of Linux trivia. I'm going to ask everybody here. What did Linus Torvalds do when he first got his PC in January 1991? What do you reckon? Turn it on. <laughs> Very true, Bob. And then after that? He installed Minix. Installed Minix. Wrong. Paul? I reckon he bought an iPhone, like the rest of us. Hey, uh, better check that out. He may, have, <laughs> he may have done that as well. What he did, actually, according to Lars Vizernius, um, a friend of Torvalds at the time... Um, he, Vizernius uh, recalls, when Linus bought his first PC, he didn't even start hacking it right away. Instead, he played computer games, especially one called something like Prince of Persia. <laughs> Prince of Persia, what a great game that was. It was, it was apparently only after he completed Prince of Persia that he uh, moved on to assembly language, so <laughs> it must be a quite a difficult game if you... I never got to the end of that game. I got the sword and then oh, had a yeah, laugh. I did. I didn't really play it much. Oh, it was good. Was it? Very, Should very I dig good, it out yeah. on an emulator? It's really now. bloody and horrible, but it's great. Oh, the animation was just fantastic. I mean, it's looking it, it, really slick. Yeah, yeah, you kind of used rotoscope copies, didn't you, did, yeah, of yeah, the people yeah, running. did, yeah. So, of course, all the notes for this podcast <laughs> <laughs> are on the TuxRadio.com website where we post fantastic news reviews, features, and more every time we feel like it. Tune in in two weeks' time for more japes. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, that guy, <laughs> that guy who hates the shouting is going to be a <laughs>